Files are a way that you can actually import information from a file. You've been using files for most of your life if you've used a computer, such as Word document, things like that. And what we're going to do today is actually look at how we can open a file, download its contents, and then use that those contents for some sort of information. Now, a lot of the information that we've used so far has been console input where the user actually inputs some sort of number or thing like that. However, we can only do that for very small amounts of information. For lots of information, we have to use a file. Files typically stored on some sort of secondary storage, like your hard drive, a thumb drive, a USB drive, or something like that. So let's take a look at what Python has in store for us. So this is intrinsic to the language, so there's no library that we have to actually include. But there is a function called open, O-P-E-N. And what that's going to do is open a file. And I'll show you how to do that. Now, the first thing is we have to set up the environment so we have a file in it. So if you notice, if you look on the left-hand side of REPL.IT, you'll notice that there's files. And what we want to do is we actually want to add another file because the file that we're writing into right now is the source code to the Python file. But we just want a test file, so we'll say test.txt. TXT standing for text. So what we've done here is I've added three names to this file. And what we're going to do is we're going to open this file. Notice these are CSVs, comma separated values. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get, grab all the first names, second names, and third names. Now, a file is row based. That means before I can, so I can't read S-J-J-T-O-A or something like that. To be able to read that, I have to read S-T-E-P-H-E-N. So I have to read an entire row first. Now, if you look at how a file is actually stored, it's just one big row or one big column, however you want to look at it. The way we have it laid out right here, where we have three rows and several columns, is just logically how it's laid out. But that's not how it's actually laid out in the file. So we have to be cognizant of that, because if I want J, well, we can't just do that. So let's take a look at what we're going to do. So FN is file input. And that's typically how I tell people to use their variables is file input. You don't have to use FN. You can use this as any variable as you have before. We're going to use open. Now, the first parameter open is a string, and that is the file name that we want to open. You notice it's test.txt. The second one is what is known as the mode. It's also a string. And we're going to put R here. R stands for read. It means we're going to read from this file. If I was to put W here, it means we're going to open this for writing. So right now, I just put R there, and now we have a file open for reading. Now, what we're going to do now is fn contains all the information I need to be able to read from this file. So let's do a print dir fn. So you'll notice over here we have several different things that we can do. Tell, seek, those things we won't be using in this class. However, they're important because tell tells you where you are inside the file. These are known as file streams. That means if I was to read a line and then read another line, I would read two different lines. The reason is because unlike a, a list or something like that, if we read something out of a file, we move what's known as a file pointer to the next line or to wherever we left it. That means the information that we had that we already read is behind us. So that is what seeking means. It means we are going to move that, that pointer left and right. Now here's an interesting function that we're going to use, read lines. Notice that's plural. Whereas this one, read line, is singular. So if we want to read a single line, we just say read line. If we want to get a list of lines, we say read lines. And you'll see that's going to be very important when we do that. Otherwise, there's read. So let's take a look at what all of these functions do. So if I was to do fn.read, I can specify a parameter which tells me how many bytes. Now, one byte is eight bits. Now, we really don't need to know what the byte bits are for this class. However, think of it this way, one character which is f, i, n, dot, that sort of stuff, is exactly one byte. So if I was to read one, it's going to read, and it's going to print whatever that one is read. So hopefully we get, let's make this capital S. So hopefully we get capital S whenever we run this program. So let's take a look what happens. We get capital S when we run the program. So first things first is we have to make sure that the file can be opened. Notice I have test.txt, so I misspelled it. What's going to occur is we're going to get a file not found error in the open. So we have to make sure that we specify the correct file name. And then fn.read will read byte by byte. So what if we want to read an entire line? Well, I can say read line. And notice what occurs. We got the first line. Now, if I was to do this a second time, so those two statements are identical, but there's two of them. 
But notice I get two different pieces of information. This is why we call these file streams. What occurs is whenever we read the line, so whenever we open the file, it's essentially a cursor, and that cursor is pointing to the very beginning of the file. If we say read line, it grabs the whole line, and now my cursor is on John Doe 44. If we were to read that line, our cursor would be on Jane Simmons. If we were to read that line, we are now known as an EOF, end of file condition. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Okay, so we have four read lines, but we only have three lines. So notice, nothing happens. So this is how you're going to do, so it doesn't throw an error if you're at the end of the file. What happens is fn.readline, fn.read, and things like that return what's called an empty string. So you know you're at the end of the file. Let me put this in a while loop. hopefully you remember what all these do. So we have an infinite loop. We grab input, which is one line from the, the test.txt file. We compare it to see if it's an empty string. It is not possible for a file to have an empty string. It's not possible because otherwise that would not be part of a file. A file is just a list of bytes that we have. And so what happens is if Python reach, reaches the end of the file, it returns the empty string. Empty string is just quotation, quotation, or single quote, single quotes. It means there's nothing in between it. So if it is that, we break out of this while loop and then we're done with the file. Okay, so notice we've printed Stephen Mars, John Doe, and Jane Simmons. Now, take a look at this. Notice there's an extra line break in between them. That's because if we went to test.txt, this non-printing character over here on the right-hand side is that backslash n, that new line character. So if you notice, new line or read line actually includes the new line character. So that's very important that you understand that before you actually start going through here. So let's take a look at what read lines does. We've done it with one, the singular version of read line. Now we're doing it with read lines. If I print A, notice we get a list of lines. So this is very important. However, think of it this way. Notice what is occurring. We're taking it from secondary storage, either a hard drive, a USB drive, or something like that. And then we're storing it into memory, the computer's memory. And so if we had a very large file, which most of you will probably be working with, big, large files, large data sets and stuff like that, will easily exceed the amount of memory that we have inside the computer. So it's very important that we understand how files are laid out so that we don't just read the whole thing into memory. Now that we know that these are strings, we could read line, process that line, go to the next line, and the previous line is already gone out of memory, so we can overwrite it with the new line. And that is a more efficient way to do this because we're not increasing the memory footprint of our program too largely. I'm gonna show you how to tell where you are inside of the file. Remember it is a file string, so we have a cursor or pointer that shows us where we're located inside the file. So if we want to, Whenever we first start a opening a file or something like that, we're going to be at cursor position zero. Remember, it's just like an array or a list where everything starts at zero and we go to the size minus one. So then let's read a line and then see where we are again. So these come out as integers. We're at the zero position because we just opened the file. If we read the line, we read Stephen Mars 37 and then backslash n. Now, Steven is seven characters, eight characters, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So where did the 16 come from? Well, there's a backslash N over there. So that backslash N gives us 16. So that's why we're at the 16th location. So where J starts, where that cursor is, that is the 16th location. So let's do something with this file where we read it in, process the information, and then output something. So FN, is going to be our file input object. And with that, that's where we could read lines and stuff like that. So remember what we can do is every time we read a line or read information, we get a string. If we did a read lines, we get a list of strings. So I'm going to do this line by line. Okay. So we've done this. This is just the setup to what we want it to do. What I want to do now is we know the data is going to be a comma separated value. So we're going to say CSV list, the comma separated value list, is equal to data.split. We're going to split it on the comma. 
And so now what we can do is we're going to get a list of all the information that we have. So what I've essentially done is I've written a program that will read it line by line, parse out the first name, last name, and age, and print those separately. So let's see what occurs when I do this. Now notice the age is a string. So let's go ahead and make that an integer and see what happens. Okay, now notice that second new line is gone. Remember, read line includes the new line character. So what gets that new line character is age. Now we could use a whole bunch of splicing techniques if we want. So if you remember with the string, we did something like this. Notice it gets rid of that new line character because that's the last character. Remember negative numbers go from the right and move themselves left. This colon is your slicing operator. And because I'm putting the number on the right hand side of the slicing operator, that means that's where I want this to end. So essentially what this statement says here is go to CSV list two, which will give me a string. Print all the characters from the left all the way to the right minus one. Okay, so that is what this is doing. It's printing all the characters except that new line character. So all these are strings and notice, let me just print a couple just so we can separate these out. There we go. So you'll notice Stephen Mars 37 comes from this location in the file. First name, last name, John Doe comes from the second line of the file. Jane Simmons one comes from the last one. Why did Jane Simmons only have a one and not a 12? Well, that's because we assumed every single line has a new line. You'll notice this only has three lines. If I was to put a blank line in there, notice now Jane Simmons is 12. But if I was to take out that blank line, Jane Simmons is now one. The reason is, is because remember, we are expecting that the entire line has a new line character at the end of it. But only two of these actually have a new line character at the end of it. This one, the Jane Simmons, is just blank. There's nothing there. And so whenever we do minus one, we're actually removing the two, not a backslash n. So the best way to do this is to say it, well, the best way to do this is to make it an integer. But you can also make an if statement. What I'm going to do is I'm going to check to see whether the ending character is a new line character. If it is a new line character, we get rid of it. If it's not, we just leave it alone. So what I'm going to do is say if CSV list two. Remember, that's a string dot ends with. So remember there was a starts with and an ends with. An end with, ends with, we'll look at the very end and see if it ends with a backslash n. If it does, we print out the negative one version. Otherwise, we print out a whole string. So now notice what occurs. Even though we don't have a new line character at the end of line three, we get age 12 printed. The reason we get age 12 printed is because of that test. We're taking a look to see if it ends with a backslash n. If it is, we remove that backslash n by using the negative one. Otherwise, we use and we print the whole thing. Now, it's kind of nice with uh, strings to do that, but age is just an integer. So if we convert it to an integer, it's going to remove the new line character anyway. But this will work for strings, integers, anything else that we, we give it. So that's how we read from files. Let's take a look at how we write to a certain file. Now notice, if I open a file that does not exist, it gives me an error. What if I try to write to a file? So we're gonna say f out file out. So we're going to use open and then output.txt. Now remember R, if we use R for the mode, that stands for read, but we're going to use W for the, the mode stand for write. Now instead of read, we're now going to use write, which is right here. So write is how we're going to write the data. We could also do write lines, which takes a list and then writes the lines. But let's take a look at what occurs. When I run this program, notice it generated output.txt. So if the file does not exist, it will create it, or at least try to create it. If your file system doesn't allow it to be created, yes, then it will throw an error. For example, if you don't have the permissions, if you're out of disk space or something like that, then it will not generate the new file. But notice it created output.txt for us. So what we're going to f out dot write lines performs the same operation that we've seen inside of something like a for loop. Something like that. So essentially what we do is we go line by line and print them. Now notice there is no backslash n on the end of the string. That means everything's gonna be on the same row. So let's go ahead and add new line characters just to see what that looks like. 
Now I'm going to delete this. Before you write over, don't overwrite, especially in REPL.IT and in output.txt. What's going to happen is if I open a file for writing, but it already exists, it overwrites that file. And so we don't want that to happen, so I'm gonna delete output.txt and then write this and see what occurs. So remember, we did f out.write lines, and now we use the for loop to do the exact same thing, and notice we get the same results. So you can use either one, f out.write or f out.write lines. Now f out.write will return how many bytes it was able to write, so the, the length of the string, so h-e-l-l-o space j-o-h-n backslash n. So it prints out how many of those it's going to print. So let's take a look at when we do print, delete this file. So notice we have 11 characters for hello space John backslash n, and we have 14 characters for hello space Steven backslash n. And that's essentially what that's printing out is it's, it's telling you here's how much I'm going to print out. And that's a good way to know what, how much data has actually been outputted. So most of the time we can assume that the file is going to write everything that we told it to write, but it might not be possible. If we run out of disk space or something like that, then we cannot write everything that we need to write. So you've seen how we can actually open files for reading, open files for writing. Uh, a lot of the things that we're going to do is we're going to read from one file, process the input, and then output to another file. So let's take a look at our test.txt. Notice these are comma separated values. I'm going to write a program that essentially goes through each one and increases the age by one and outputs to another file. So let's take a look at how we're going to write this type of program. So we have an input file and an output file. I'm going to use fin to open test.txt. I'm going to use fout to open output.txt. Notice I have two different variables. One is storing the object for test.txt. The other one is storing the object for output.txt. So what I'm going to do is there's two ways I can do this. I can store all of the information from the input file into memory and then process it and then output it. But remember what I was saying. Say we had a billion lines or something like that. I don't want to store all one billion lines in memory because one line does not affect the other. So we can do these and I can do it line by line. Take a line, add one to the age, write that line. Take another line, add to the age, right and so that's how I'm going to do this so what I've done is I've started an infinite loop and we say okay while it's true let's keep reading lines well remember if that line is blank that means there's no more lines to read and we're going to break okay now I have a line we know they're comma separated values so I'm gonna split those on the comma separated values. We also know that the ending line uh, might have a backslash n. What I've done is I essentially overwrote the string without the backslash n on them. And so let's take a look at what we're going to do now. So now I have this, and we can actually convert this into an integer, add it all in one, okay? So we're going to do CSV2. Okay, so what I've done here is now I've actually stored this as an integer. I can convert it back to a string, but there's, well, I do have to convert this back to a string because remember, whenever we write, we're going to write string data. It doesn't know how to write integers and stuff like that. So what I've done here is I've converted the age into an integer, added one to it, and then converted that back into a string so that we can write it to the file. Okay, so the reason we had to split this is so that we can get that age by itself. Now that we don't have to do anything with the first name or the last name, but now that we have that, we can do f out. Okay, write lines CSV. Now remember, write lines will not put a backslash n in that. Essentially, it was the same thing as saying for i in the list, write the list, write the list, write the list, write the list. Now remember, we remove the backslash n. When we're done with it, we have to put it back in. So we remove the backslash n. Now remember, int CSV2 will automatically remove that backslash n, but we're just showing you what it's going to look like. We're just doing it uh, manually whenever we do this. So let's take a look at what this file generates. So always remember to close whenever you're done with them. So notice there is no output.txt yet. We're going to run our program. And notice what we get here, csv2.ends with, 
index out of range. Well, let's take a look at list.txt. So anyone notice, this is a CSV file. So with CSV files, it stands for comma separated values. What did this do? So whenever we split on a space, what occurred? Well, what occurred is, remember, everything gets lumped into that first element. If there's no comma at all, this list only has one element. And so what do we always do before we check the data? We are not sure that the input file has the data that we want it to have. And so we always make sure that it has the amount of data that we're expecting. So if the length of data is not equal to three, this is malformed. Okay. So what we've done now is now we've made a check. Anytime we get something that does not have the elements that we expected, it's going to print error with line. Now I'm gonna leave this still. So hopefully a lot of you were thinking, hey, why did he put a space there instead of a comma? Well, I wanna show you how to error check whenever we go through this file. Now let's run it. Now we see error with line, error with line, error with line. That's because we have not changed our split to a comma yet. Let's go ahead and do that. But notice it doesn't give us that error. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to print a useful error message to the user that says, hey, here's why I got an error with the line. Now let's make this a comma. Okay, so now we don't get any errors with lines, so we execute the else statement, and let's take a look at our output. Notice, now we have Stephen Mars 38. Remember what right lines does. Right lines, are split, first of all, takes out the delimiter. So the delimiter no longer exists. Right lines prints one information package from the list at a time. So let's take a look at how we can fix this. So in essence, we can't use right lines to do this. Just trying to show you what right lines actually does. Remember, it's just a list of strings that we have in CSV. And all right lines is gonna do is go through each one of those elements and write them to the file. So instead of doing that, we can go for i in CSV. Okay. Now after we're done writing that information element, now we wanna write out the comma. Now, hopefully you're thinking, hey, wait a minute, something else is gonna go wrong here, but there is. So let's take a look at what this is going to do. Okay, now we have our output.txt. Has everybody got what they're going to, what the problem is? You'll notice that there is a common out at the end. Now with split, this would have added an, an extra element at the end. So what we can do with this is we can go to CSV all the way to the very last element, and then we f out.write CSV2 without the comma. Another way we can do is we can put an if statement inside the for loop. Now, a lot of times we don't want to put if statements inside of for loops because that if statement must make that comparison for every single one of the elements. If we had 50,000 columns with separated by commas, we'd have to make that check 50,000 times, even though we know the only time we don't want to make that check is at the very end. And so what we've done is we printed all but the last one, and then we print out the last one without the comma. So let's take a look at what this does. Okay, it runs, we go to output.txt, and now Stephen Mars, which used to be 37, is now 38. John Doe, who used to be 45, 44, is now 45, and Jameson is now 13. How to read from a file, process some sort of the input, and then output to a separate file. So everything we've done has not changed from what we do with the console. We take inputs, we process those inputs, and then we output something. So we've done the same thing with files. We take an input file, process its inputs, and then output to an output file. You don't have to have an output file if you don't wanna to write to a file. If you wanna write this stuff to a console, you can do that instead. And so this gives you the versatility of files. Files, remember, the reason we're using files is because we have a large storage of information that we need to do something on. Don't use read line, the, the plural version, because what it's going to do is gonna read the entire thing and then store that in the memory. Well. Most engineers work on large data sets and that will cause problems, especially if you start running out of memory. So what I would recommend is doing exactly what I've done in this program, where we go line by line. Now, if the lines interact with each other, say I need information from line one and line two at the same time, and then do something with them, well then you can't use this. But because each line is distinct, I can add the one to the age of the first line, which is Stephen Mars here, without knowing Jane Doe or Jane Simmons, or John Doe and Jane Simmons. And so that is the logic that needs to go behind how you are going to implement these programs.